Mountain Crossroads. For those of you who don't know me or those online, my name is Alex and I'm the lead pastor here. And I am so excited to share this message with you today. And, and as I share this message, I'm going to read a bunch of different scriptures. And I want to encourage you to read along with me. Uh, we're kicking off this brand new series called Sincerely God, that, that the Bible is a love letter. Now, if you've ever played a sports team, some uh, sports teams, everyone gets to play, and some, they draft you or they pick you, right? The, the, one, the ones where you have to try out, you have to put your best effort into it, right? And then they post who gets in and who not. That's, that's the kind of team I'm talking about, the one that has cuts. Now, anxiety runs throughout the whole season as you get ready for the tryouts or even as you're playing because you don't know if you don't play well enough, you're going to be cut, right? Or they'll replace you with someone else. And even though you're competing against other people and other teams, you actually feel like you're competing with your own team to see who gets the spot on that team. That's the team I'm talking about. But, but what happens if you make the cut? You feel like it's the most amazing thing in the world. You're like, yes, they like me. They really like me. But perhaps it's not just a team. Perhaps it was a job you tried out for, right, or applied for, or a college, or maybe even a musical or something big like American Idol. I don't know. But you know that feeling when someone says yes to you. Yes, you're the one. I'm picking you above everyone else. We also know that feeling of rejection, right? When we desperately wanted to be on that team, and someone else gets chosen over us, or another applicant gets the dream job we've been wanting a whole life, or the college you've been thinking about since a child, and you get rejected from. It's that gut-wrenching feeling in your stomach where you're like, ah, oh. you want to curl up in a ball, hide your face from the world, and disappear for a bit. Your dreams have been crushed. And the anxiety between applying for that job or team or college and hearing about it is astronomical. Ask any senior right now. They're probably, you know, their minds are going all over the place. But, um, you know, in, at, as they prepare for college and, and they're like, where am I going to go next? And what school am I going to go to? And what do I choose? It will cause you to lose sleep. You will be wondering if you got in or not. If you could have practiced more or tried harder or had a better resume to get that job, you'll second guess everything in anticipation of the results. But what if, before you even tried out, before you even got the information, before you even thought about the team, the job, or the school, you were already accepted? Wouldn't that change everything? Wouldn't that make your anxiety disappear? Wouldn't you feel good about yourself that this dream job or school or team wanted you? They wanted you. And they wanted you even before you knew you wanted them. Oh, what a relief it would feel. I would be overwhelmed with gratitude, humbled that this team or job or school thought I was so special that they wanted to pursue me. This is exactly what Ephesians 1 is talking about. The book of Ephesians is a, is a group of letters written to the church of Ephesus by the Apostle Paul. Now, the, church, the city of Ephesus had 300,000 in population. It was a leading trade center in the Roman Empire and worshipped the pagan goddess Diana. In Ephesians 1.4, we'll see how God chose you. Ephesians 1.4, will you read it with me? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love. Our God chose us. Our God chose you before you even chose him. Before you were even born, before even the world was created, God chose us. God chose you. You see, the greatest team to ever, ever exist, even greater than Steph Curry and the Warriors, even greater than Tom Brady and the Patriots, 
the greatest team ever to exist. It's God. And, he's, and we have the greatest coach ever. And he has chosen you. Not because you or I have done anything, but because God knew exactly how special you are. God's story is not just amazing. It's the greatest story ever told. And you are a part of it. Today we're going to talk about the Bible is a love letter. And what we'll discover is God's story is personal. God's story is a love letter. And God's story connects you to his love. Father God, we just give you great thanks. We give you thanks for the way you chose us. The way from the beginning of time that you thought about us. And God, that you love us. And that you pursue us relentlessly. And Father God, help us to just submit to you and to give our life over to you. Help us to honor you, to praise you, and to surrender over to you. Father God, help us to receive the word today and to praise you all of our days. In your son's precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to continue in Ephesians 1. And today we're going to look primarily at Ephesians 1. And we're going to see how God's story is personal. We will primarily be uh, going in the first 4 through 12, but we'll skip around to a few other verses as well. So Ephesians 1, 5. Ephesians 1, 5. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Awesome. It is a beautiful thing that before... God created anything. He actually chose us. That even before we were born, God chose us. Well, not to diminish what Paul says here in Ephesians 1, 4 through 5. Believers are chosen by God. And they are chosen before they even do anything for God or have done anything with God. You see, his love for us is prior to our existence. In Christ, we have his righteous imputed to us at the moment of salvation. And the day will come when we're standing before God, holy and blameless. We will be totally freed and redeemed from any evidence of sin. As it notes in 2 Thessalonians 2.13. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. Because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the awesome. But God didn't just choose us from the beginning. What Ephesians 1 5 describes is that even when we mess up, that God has orchestrated our adoption back into the family. That's how amazing of a God we have. He not just loves us before we were born, but even when we mess up, even when we stumble and make mistakes that God has already orchestrated our adoption. The word here for adoption is also translated as engrafted. Now, in agriculture, to grafting a plant is the process of joining two plant parts together called the scion and the rootstock. So they grow together as one plant. We are grafted with God so that we grow in likeness of God. John Calvin, classic theologian, says it like this. For if we are chosen in Christ, it is outside ourselves. It is not from the sight of our deserving, but because of our Heavenly Father has engrafted us through the blessings of adoption into the body of Christ. Short, the, the name of Christ excludes all merit and everything which men have of themselves. Romans 8.15 puts it like this. Will you read with me? Romans 8.15. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Oh, such a good verse. In other words, we are brought into as full-fledged children of the Most High by formally adopting us into the spiritual family. In adoption, we are given the same rights as children born into the family. And God did this through Jesus, and it pleased him. One of, uh, my fa one of the shows I've come to really love over the last couple of years is a show called Parenthood. And there's, it's a 
it's, uh, it's a TV show about the Braverman family trying to figure things out. And there's these two grandparents, and then they have four kids, and then they have a bunch of grandkids, right? And they're all trying to figure things out. And in one scene, Joel and Julia Graham are adopting this kid named Victor. And so they go before the judge, and the judge goes, do you realize by signing these documents that you're taking full responsibility for their health, his health, his education, his care, his medical bills? And they go, yes, absolutely. They're excited. And then he turns to Victor and says, do you, how do you feel about this adoption? And he goes, good, good. And then what I love is the grandpa steps up and says, Judge, I'd like to say something. As grandparents of Victor, we will do our best we can to give Victor what we have given our own children, which is unconditional love and support. And then each member chimes in and talks about how they're so excited to have Victor as part of their family and telling things they're going to do with Victor. And then at the end of the clip, the judge says, to Victor, it's quite a family you're coming into. You see, the same can be said about God when we recognize the team or family that we are coming into. God's family, it's quite a family we are coming into. One that embodies love because God is love. What I have found is the stories that we love the most usually have characters we can relate to, plot that engages us, and messages that mean something, hope, triumph, and love, maybe even all of the above. The best stories are personal. We get lost in them. We, we feel like we're in the middle of the stories. And just for a second, we might even think, that's our reality. But even the best stories come to an end. When we turn that last page or the credits roll, we suddenly look around and go, oh, we actually weren't in the story. We were just an observer to the story. But there's one story, the greatest story ever told, that doesn't end that way. It not only feels personal, it is personal. You see, it's a story you've already been a part of. It's a story that was you were in before you were even born, and it will be, you will be part of that story even after you are gone. And right now, you get to play a part in that story. It's the story of God, his love, and his relationship for all of creation, you and me. You see, God's love is so deeply personal. It's not this abstract idea that's in space, right? You know, it is intimate, it is more intimate than the love that a parent has for their own kid. His love is beyond our comprehension, you see that everything God does for us is out of love for us. Ephesians 1.4. In love, he has chosen us. In love, he has adopted us. In love, we are made a part of God's story. In your notes, it says this. God's story is personal. It comes out of his love for us. God's story is personal. It comes out of his love for us, that's in your notes. What then is the purpose of God's love for us? If we continue in Ephesians 1, we'll see verses 6 to 7. Read with me Ephesians 1, verses 6 through 7. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Ah, oh, such a good verse. In him we have what? We have redemption where we find nowhere else. There is no possible redemption outside of Jesus. As humans, we screw up. We massively screw up all the time. We, you know, we just have to take a glimpse at the news. And we know the devastation that is happening in our world. Our world promotes all kinds of ways to find about redemption, right? They, they talk about magical potions, drugs, to sex, all kinds of things, but yet nothing actually redeems us. It is only through Christ that we find redemption. It is only through God's love that we actually become whole. And 1 
And Colossians 1, 13 through 14 says it like this. Colossians 1, 13 through 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, forgiveness and redemption go hand in hand. We cannot have one without the other. The, to forgive means to give up the right to punish. Making forgiveness possible was a major accomplishment of God since it required the blood and the death of his son, Jesus Christ. This generous decision to do it for us, it was God's grace that he lavished upon us with all wisdom and understanding. Ephesians 1 verse 8 puts it like this. Ephesians 1 8. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. When I read the Bible, it is more than just a story to me. It is personal. It's more than just, it's a love story. It's more than just a, a notation of places and people and things that happen. It's actually a letter, a love letter that's addressed to you and I. I know letters aren't very common anymore, but I love letters. That's why I, I write letters all the time, even though my handwriting's pretty bad. Um, before emails and texts and emojis and social media. Yep, see, everyone's laughing because they know my handwriting's bad. You sent letters to say hi to people, right? And I, I, I love that. I, um, we ha my kids have a, a compassion kid and, um, that we sponsor. And once in a while, we write letters, and it just brings joy to write letters to individuals. But, you know, when in the... Back, back before email and text, we used to write letters all the time. And uh, probably the biggest letters we used to write to each other were love letters, right? And when you would get a love letter, you would cherish it. You'd put it under your pillow or put it in your nightstand or read it and reread it and reread it again. And that's actually how I began to see the Bible. It's the greatest story ever told, but it's in the form of a love letter to you and I. That's why I love to reread the scripture over and over again and see how God penned his love to us. You know, it's not just a book to me. It's actually a personal invitation into the story that God has been telling since the beginning of time. And that story is the story of God's incredible love for humanity, for you and I. I want to try something with you. And... and uh, we're going to reread Ephesians 1, 4 through 12 altogether. In your notes, there's this other page on your clipboard. And I want you to pull it out if you don't have it. If not, I think we'll have the scripture on the thing. But any time there is a blank, I want you to actually fill in your name. And um, see how God penned this love letter to you. It should be the second page in the clipboard. If you don't have it, we'll post it online later and you can do it. But I'm going to read it, and just you can read the scripture silently, but every time you see a blank there, fill in your name. And I'm going to put crossroads in there um, instead of us or him. For he chose crossroads in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined crossroads for adoption of sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of the glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, Crossroads has redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on Crossroads. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to Crossroads the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be in effect when the times reach the fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on, uh, on earth under Christ. In him, crossroads was also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything 
in conformity with the purpose of his will and o'er that crossroads who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be praised for his glory. Now I want you to give you a little homework and when you go home, take this and put your name in those blanks and reread it again and again and hear God's love story of how he penned it for you. On the back side, it talks about what God actually has done for you. The things that the scripture tells you that God has done. Kind of what, uh, how you might feel about this and give a response to it. I want you to know that God's story is a love story. It tells us all the ways in which God loves us. That's, on, that's in your notes, and that's what you will discover when you do this. The God story is a love story, a love letter. It tells us all the ways in which God loves us. It also connects us to his love. Now, we're going to continue in Ephesians 1, verses 11 through 12. Ephesians 1, 11 through 12. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. Ah. You see, finally in Christ we are enriched. We have been chosen and predestined according to God's plan to receive his inheritance in full. Not because of anything we have done, but because of what God has done on our behalf. And we will possess it in full when we stand before him in heaven. The inheritance is not an accident or whim. What I want you to hear is that (laughs) it is in keeping with God's plan from the very beginning. From the very beginning, his love story, his love is woven into our story. Why? Because our story is part of God's story. And God invites us to experience his love by joining his story. Psalm 119, 64 and Ephesians 1, 9. We're going to read these each three times. And the goal here is to stitch these words to your heart to be reminded of God's love for you. Psalm 119, 64. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. Let's read it again. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. One more time. The earth is filled with your love, Lord. Teach me your decrees. In Ephesians 1, 9, we'll see this. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. Let's go again. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. One last time. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. Oh, When we stitch God's words to our heart, we are reminded of God's love for us. And we are connected to his story. We understand his love, the love that God has for us, and the love that God has for the world, and the love that we should have for others as well. One of my favorite things is nature. And one of my favorite trees in nature is redwoods. I love how majestic and tall they are. But what is actually interesting about a redwood is their roots are quite shallow, only about six feet deep or so. And you're thinking, how does a redwood stand if it has shallow roots? The interesting thing about redwoods is their roots are intertwined with one another, literally holding each other up. The trees go very closely together and are dependent upon each other for nutrients and um, The redwoods, the only way they stand, they have strength and ability, is by other redwoods. God's love is like the redwood root system. It binds us all together. It's what keeps us standing upright. We may not acknowledge it, but our story is part of God's story. Everything is woven together. It is literally holding all all of us up 
And when we tap into God's story, we discover something magical. Our eyes and our heart is open to a whole new world. We realize that we're not alone. From the beginning of creation, we were bound to his story. And together, we can help others discover his story. You see in your notes, it'll say this, God's story connects you to his love. It reminds you that from the beginning, we were bound to his story, to a bigger story, his story. We are bound to a bigger story, his story. I hope what you've heard today is that God's story is not just another story. It's not just a book of random people and places and things. It's very personal. It's a love letter that God penned specifically for you. This great love letter has uh, characters and stories that have changed my life and perhaps even changed yours. God shows us his love in a lot of ways. Perhaps you've experienced it through worship today, right? Or, or prayer, the 24 hours of prayer we just did. Or, or even you experience God through listening to a message or reading a book or going out in nature and experiencing God. But what I believe is the truest and deepest understanding of God's love for us can only be found by spending time with his word, the Bible. God's love letter to you. You see, God's story is so personal. It comes out of his love for us. God's story is a love letter. It tells us all the ways in which God loves us. God's story connects you to his love. It reminds you from the beginning that we were bound to a bigger story, his story. And today I want you to invite you to learn a little bit more about his story by reading the Bible, God's love letter. At home, I want to challenge you and encourage you to take Ephesians 1, 4 through 12. Read it. Read it through daily and put your name in there and see how God penned a beautiful love story to you, a beautiful love letter to you. I also want to encourage you to stitch his words to your heart. The two uh, verses that we read three times are our memory verses for this week. And the more we know of God's promises and we put them in our heart, the more we are open to God's love. We're going to move into a time of prayer. And... Um, I want to invite you to say the prayer of salvation with me. And even if you've said it before, or if this is your first time, I want to invite you to say it. If, if, if uh, you want to receive the gift of Jesus, just to say, God, I want you in my heart. As individuals, we have to choose and decide whether or not we follow Jesus. And this gift is available to everyone. It's our decision whether we follow him or not. And even if we've already made that decision, we need to be reminded of God's grace and love for us. So I'm going to pray for us and then invite us into this. Father God, I give you great thanks. God, you pinned a beautiful letter to us. You brought together people from different nations and different times to, to write this letter. God, you stitched this upon our heart. Father God, help us to receive your goodness. Help us to receive your love. And God, if we have not made a choice to pursue you or to follow you, uh, God, may we, oh, may our hearts be open today. And for those who uh, have made a decision to follow Jesus, or those who have done it in the past, I invite to say the salvation prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Please forgive me. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Now help me to live for you the rest of my life. 